Living Torches of the Divine Flame Sermon by New Hieromartyr St. Seraphim Zvezdinsky on the Divine Liturgy Let us continue our discussion on the Divine Liturgy. From our temple today, my dear ones, let us travel back to the distant pagan times of Antioch and the first centuries of Christianity. Christians are being persecuted, They are being arrested and locked up in terrible prisons, after which they are led away to the arenas and given over to be devoured by wild beasts. They are smeared with tar and lit on fire, so that they are revealed as living torches. At this time in Antioch, it happened that persecutors seized the priest Lucian together with his flock. He was condemned, and while in prison his flock said with sorrow to St. Lucian, Our dear Father, how will we partake of the holy mysteries? Lucian lay motionless on a hard board. His legs were shackled so that he could not stand up. Do you have bread and wine? he asked. Yes, some kind people have brought some. They answered, Only, how will you serve the liturgy, for we have no altar? Bring here the bread and wine and place them on my chest. Let it be a living altar for the most pure mysteries of the Lord, proclaimed the imprisoned priest. And so they brought the bread and wine, and St. Lucian served the divine liturgy on his own chest. He, together with all the assembled Christians, partook of the holy mysteries. In such a manner did the early Christians serve the liturgy. They did not have fixed prayers or rituals. During these times of persecution, they served the liturgy underground, in the catacombs. In the evening, they would start the service and finish as the sun began to rise. They did not finish because they grew tired of prayer, but rather because it was dangerous to live as a Christian. In various places of the pagan world, the liturgy was offered, but not in every place every day. For example, in one place it would be offered four times a week, as St. Basil the Great says about his flock. In very early times, Christians gathered together every day, but most of all on the day of the resurrection, which is called the day of sun and bread. In remembrance of Christ's resurrection, it is called sun of righteousness, and it is called bread in remembrance of Holy Communion. The service would start with readings from the Holy Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, and then prayers began. They did not say or read prayers from a prayer book, but rather from the heart. Prayer was fervent and impromptu. Their hearts, warm with the grace of the Holy Spirit, gave forth wondrous hymns and songs. Almost none of these prayers and teachings are preserved. Only in fragments from later times do we find indications that some of our prayers in the liturgy repeat the songs of the early Christians. And so it is today, our exclamation, Let us love one another is but cold words. For the early Christians, it was full of deep meaning. Then they felt, in their underground churches, that they in truth loved one another, and that they were very close to each other. As a sign of this love and brotherhood, those present would exchange a kiss, men with men and women with women. The priestly ministers also gave the holy kiss to each other. And so, At this moment of the liturgy, the sounds of hymns were intertwined with another sound, the holy kiss. This tradition remains today in only a weak form. The priestly ministers kiss each other on the shoulder and the deacon kisses the cross on his stole. In the same way today when we exclaim, let us lift up our hearts, only the choir coldly responds, we lift them up to the Lord. But it was not so in the time of the early Christians. For they all, with all their heart, proclaim these words. For they truly abode in the Lord with all their soul. They did not notice the passing of time, nor did they feel tired. Only the dawn, because caution was needed, forced these Christians who had gathered in the evening to disperse to their homes. So long did they pray. This is spoken of in the Acts of the Apostles. The length of their prayer is evident from the account of the miraculous saving from death of the young man who fell out of the window during the sermon of St. Paul. So fervent was the prayer of these Christians that they did not even notice how time passed. 
Only after long prayer did the communion of the faithful take place. In ancient times, Christians received communion daily, both men and women. Later, they began to commune less frequently, but no less than once a week. Believers would come up to the altar to receive the holy mysteries, since at that point no iconostasis separated the sanctuary from the nave. First the men would commune and then the women. For those too ill or those in official service, the deacon would afterwards bring them holy communion at home. So pure were the lives of the early Christians that they were able to be prepared every day to receive Holy Communion. This is how the liturgy was in ancient times. If today someone asks you, my friends, what is the divine liturgy? Answer, it is the testament of our Savior. He himself has said, do this in remembrance of me. He has left for us as a testament the service of the liturgy to taste of his life-creating body and blood. Answer that the liturgy is the diamond, that priceless gift from Christ. The liturgy is the river, strengthening and refreshing, flowing from the side of Christ. The liturgy is the golden bridge on which only it is possible to come to eternal life. Lovers of the liturgy, this priceless diamond, this river that brings to life, remember this testament of Christ. Walk upon this golden bridge which will save you from falling into hell. Beloved ones, do not listen to those who run away from the liturgy and those who flee from the chalice. These are unfortunate, lost, and pitiable people. They are unable to see the brilliance of the diamond. They are fainting from thirst and have wandered far away from the river of Christ. They fall into the chasm while trying to run away from the bridge. But you... Always cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.